Well, this being the Sunday before Easter, this is what we would call Palm Sunday. So what we're going to look at today is when Jesus rode in to Jerusalem. When he rode in, he was riding on the road of victory. That day, 2000, over 2,000 years ago, Jesus took that, tri that triumphal ride into Jerusalem. It was to be his last time to ride into Jerusalem. Now, when you talk about triumphal, when you look at that word, it means commemorating or celebrating victory. Jesus was riding in to Jerusalem for victory. Our text this morning is going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 through 44. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem for the last time. He knows why he's going there. He knows he's going to be crucified. And we also know that next Sunday, which we call Easter, is also Resurrection Sunday. And we know that at that time, Jesus rose, rose from the grave and that he lives forever. And because of his resurrection, we also have that opportunity to live forever. So Jesus is riding on the road to victory here. Now I got to thinking about it. We're going to be seeing another ride to victory here not before too long. March Madness is going on, right? Whoever ends up winning that, when they get home, there's going to be a parade for them. Same thing happens with the, in the NFL. When that team wins the Super Bowl, they get home, they hold a parade. It's a victory parade. Same, same way with you know, professional baseball or the NBA. They win that championship, they get, to, they get to ride on the road to victory because they won. It's the same thing here with Jesus. He's riding that road to victory into Jerusalem. And he's met by a lot of people. We're going to be discussing these people today. First we want to look at is that is the prophecy that talks about the road to victory. So we look at verses 29 through 34 here in Luke 19. It says, And it came to pass, and when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain of Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you will find a coat tied on which no one has ever sat loose it and bring it here and if anyone asks you why are you losing it thus you shall say to him because the Lord has need of it so those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them but as they were loosing the coat the owner of it said to them why are you loosing the coat and they said the Lord has need of him Jesus had to have that donkey because that's going to fulfill another one of the prophecies. If we look at Zechariah 9.9, 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding a donkey, a coat, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah spoke those words 520 years B.C. Just 66 years before he wrote this, Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Babylonians. So in Jerusalem's day, or in Zechariah's day, Jerusalem was still sitting in ruins. And the process of rebuilding had just gotten started. But what Zechariah is speaking of here is the Messiah. He's speaking of the time when Jesus is going to be riding back in, in going to be riding to Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, it's, what's really amazing is when Jesus rode that road to victory is that Jesus was saying who he is. 
that he is who he said he was. I want to look real quick at the prophecies. The prophecies from the Old Testament that, that pointed toward Christ. There's a man named Adrian Rogers. He, he did a sermon one day, and he calculated the probability of one man, one man, fulfilling just eight of the prophecies referring to the Messiah is one in 100 trillion. That's the odds of one man fulfilling just eight prophecies from the Old Testament. He went on to further illustrate even further. He says, suppose we take 100 trillion silver dollars and we lay them over the state of Texas. It would cover the state of Texas two feet deep. Now you take one of those silver dollars and you mark it and you put it in Texas and then you mix this whole thing up. And you blind, put a blindfold on the man and send him in. Tell him he can walk anywhere he wants in the state of Texas with that blindfold on and then pick up one silver dollar. Him picking up the one that was marked would be one in 100 trillion. It gives an example of what the odds are of a single man fulfilling just eight of the prophecies of the Old Testament. Well, Jesus fulfilled a lot more than just eight. Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies the first time he came. What we're looking at here, when he rode into Jerusalem here, that's the first coming of Christ. He's right into, into Jerusalem. So we're going to take a look at not only the first coming, but we're going to take a little bit, a quick look at the second coming too during this. If you want to know about the second coming of Christ, be with us tonight as we go into chapter 20 of Revelation on our Bible study. But there is one very important prophecy that Jesus has yet to fulfill, and that is his second coming. As our Savior that day, he presented himself to the people of Jerusalem. He is fulfilling another prophecy, the prophecy that's that was written about him and they'll tell about riding into Jerusalem. Now there were many types of people on this road that he rode into when he rode into Jerusalem. We, we see many times in the Old Testament where it talks about the multitudes. Well, there's a multitude that day sitting there waiting for him to ride in. But there were many different kinds of people that were waiting for him. We, when we envision it or we watch some of these movies about Jesus riding into Jerusalem, then all we see is the people laying laying the palm leaves in front of him and celebrating and everything else. They weren't the only ones there. Some of them were his followers. When we look at the second part of verse 29 and 30, it says that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you where you are to enter. You will find a coat tied and no one has ever set loose it and bring it to, bring it to me. Jesus is preparing to fulfill that prophecy. You know, at that time, Jesus had this, we, we always talk about the 12 disciples. Well, these 12 disciples that we talk about all the time, the, that we read about in the, in the New Testament, and we talk about, and we have sermons about, they were the ones that Jesus personally chose and said, you will follow me. But on this day, when he was riding that donkey into Jerusalem, there was also an, another multitude of disciples. These are the ones that followed him on their own without him asking them to. And these were sitting there and waiting for him. In verse 37, it says, Then, as he was now drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. They were following Jesus because they'd seen what Jesus had been doing. He'd seen, they had seen the miracles he had performed. He had, they had seen the, and heard everything that he had done. So they were following him. But you know, there was also some that weren't too excited about Jesus showing up. In the book of John, chapter 11, verse 56, it says, then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will not 
come to the feast. The followers that were excited, they were praising his name. They were praising the Messiah. But some of them that were there were not his friends. They were actually his enemies. In verse 39, it says, And some of the Pharisees called him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. The Pharisees were there. They were in that crowd when Jesus was riding into Jerusalem. When we look at the life of Jesus here on earth, we know that his enemies were never far away. They were always following him, trying to catch him, saying something where they could rebuke him. They were always trying to constantly trip him up with some theological question. And they had representatives that day in that crowd for when Jesus was riding into Jerusalem. I'm sure when he was riding in, you had the Pharisees, you had the Sadducees, the, the chief priests, you had the scribes and the elders, all there, you know, even today. Jesus has the enemies in this world. There's the enemies, just like the Pharisees were back then. There were very religious people who said, look at me, rather than pointing towards Christ. We fight the same kind of things today, but we have Jesus on our side. We have Pharisees out there. We have the Sadducees. We have the ones that, are, that would love to shut us up. And that's what they were trying to do. What was meant right there. Teach, teacher, rebuke your disciples. In other words, shut them up. We don't want to hear about it. There was also the skeptics. We meet skeptics every day. So in this great cloud, the crowd, there was people that had seen some of Christ's miracles, had heard some of his preaching, but they weren't convinced yet. They didn't really trust that this was the Messiah. They did not trust that this was the Son of God. We see this in our country today. First, we see the ones that are the enemies of Christ, but we also see the ones that, well, this is a special man, but I'm not convinced that he's the Son of God. I'm not convinced this this man that died on the cross is actually here to do anything for me. There are some religions out there that speak of Jesus, but they usually speak of him as just a great teacher. So that day when he was right into Jerusalem, he had the skeptics there, the ones that really didn't believe him. They had not been convinced. In verses 35 through 38, then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their clothes on the coat, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then, as he was drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen him doing, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. When we look at the book of John, we also see where they, they holler, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But they were praising Jesus as they came in. They were praising him for what he had done, for what they had seen him do. I can just imagine what it must have been like that day. Imagine what it would it be like to be in that crowd as Jesus rode, rode on that donkey coming into Jerusalem. They had seen his mighty works. There's a lot that we can learn from that multitude of, multitude of disciples there. But you know, they had a lot to rejoice in. They had seen Christ's miracles. But you know, today, we have even more to rejoice than what they had. Some of the things we've got to look at is we're on, we're on this side of the cross. They were on that side. This is before Jesus hung on the cross and died. We know what happened. We know for a fact that our Christ was crucified. We also know for a fact that he rose from the dead. We also know for a fact that he ascended into heaven. We also know that he sent another. And that the Holy Spirit, when we accept Christ our Savior, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. So we also know that he's always with us. 
We also know that we can have a personal relationship with him. We also know that one day he is coming back. And when he does that, we also know that we will get to live with him for eternity. We also know that Jesus has defeated sin, Satan, death, hell, and he's also defeated the grave. One of these days, there's going to be a great trumpet in the sky. And those of us that are still here that have accepted Christ our Savior, we will be called up to join him in the sky. So on that, on that day, they praised him for what he had done. We all not only get to praise him for what he had done before the cross, but we get to praise him for what he had done after the cross. But we also need to praise him for what the future holds for us. In the book of John, chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, it says, The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. These people, when they met him out there, we already read how his disciples had laid their clothing on the donkey and how they laid the clothing on the ground for the donkey to walk on. But now we see the others that are taking the palm leaves and laying in front of him. The palm branch symbolizes victory and triumph. And it's through Jesus' death that he conquered not only the principalities of this world and all the powers, but he conquered death for us. So it's only fitting that when he rode into Jerusalem that they would lay those palm branches in front of him. This crowd that I'm talking about, when he was riding in, they were calling him the king of Israel. They also called him the king that comes in the name of the Lord. And just like the crowd today, or yesterday, we should also praise him for who he is. He is Emmanuel, which means God is with us. He's our Lord. He's our master, savior, comforter. He's also our healer. He's also the one that helps us carry our burdens. He's also our friend. We tend to forget that sometimes, that Jesus is our friend. So like I said, not everybody was thrilled to see Jesus on that day. There were some that were fur furious. When they, they told him, remember, rebuke your disciples. Shut them up. But they were not going to be shut up. Jesus was not going to tell his disciples to shut up. In fact, he, said, he answered them and said, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. If they had been able to shut up the disciples of Christ at that time, God would have rose up the rocks to proclaim the victory. I don't know about you, but I thought I think that would have been kind of neat to watch. Do you imagine the looks on the faces of the Pharisees and the Sadducees when all of a sudden these stones started praising Jesus? I also want to take a look at real quick on the perception that Jesus had on the road to the road into Jerusalem, on the road to on the road of victory. When Jesus was riding towards Jerusalem, as he got closer, he began to weep. Why would he be weeping? This is this is a time of triumph for him. It was a time of praise. But Jesus was weeping. He was not weeping for himself. He was not weeping over the fact that he's going to be in the Garden of Gethsemane praying to God that this cup would pass from him. He was not weeping knowing that he's going to be hung on the cross. He was weeping because he knew what the consequences were for Jerusalem for rejecting him. If we look at verses 41 through 44, it said, As he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make you, that, that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. 
For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus here is talking about the future destruction of, of Jerusalem. Even though they're celebrating the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem at this time, it's only going to be a matter of days before these same people will haul and crucify him. And he's talking here about what's going to happen because of that. It talks about how the Romans are going to overwhelm the city. They're going to build a trench all the way around it. They're going to not allow anybody out. All the residents of Jerusalem at that time are going to be trapped in Jerusalem. Titus commanded his soldiers to dig up the city and the whole area was leveled. Jesus knew this was going to happen in just a few years and it did. But not only was the, the city laid to waste, but the citizens of the city of Jerusalem were also laid to waste. They were massacred. And not just the grown but also their children. They were slaughtered. All because they rejected Christ. It also says that there's not one stone left on top of another. When you look at and study how Jerusalem was built, some of these stones that they talk about that were not left on top of another, they weighed tons. But they were yanked off their foundation. They were yanked off of each other so that not one stone was left on top of another. All this would happen because of their rejection of Christ at this time. Jesus knew what was coming. Jesus knew what was going to happen to him. He knew what the people of Jerusalem were going to face in the future. And because of that, he was weeping. He wasn't weeping for himself. So even, even though Jesus knew he was going to be rejected, he was going to be crucified, he showed his amazing love and compassion at this time because he weeped for these people, because he knew what was in store for them. He had compassion on Jerusalem that day when he weeped, but... We need to remember that today he has compassion for us. He has compassion for our lost souls. So we need to, each one of us, look inside us and decide, have we truly surrendered ourselves to him? Jesus is longing to redeem each and every person that lives on this world. It's up to us to accept it. And finally, the power on the road to victory. At that time, Jesus had great power. And he has that great power today. He came, the people saw his mighty works then. But I guarantee you, the world has not seen anything yet. Then when he died, he ascended to heaven. But he left a promise saying, I'm coming back. And then when he comes back, I can guarantee you things are going to be much different when he returns this time to Jerusalem than what he did the first time. Let's do a little comparison here between the first coming and the second coming. On the first coming, he went into Jerusalem riding a colt. If you remember our last study on on chapter 19 of Revelations, we know that his second coming, he's going to be riding a great white horse. He was riding alone the first time he went to Jerusalem. This on the second coming of Christ, all the saints are also going to be riding with him on white, on white horses. That's us, as Christians. We'll be riding with him. The first time he wore a crown of, a crown of thorns, the second time, he's going to be wearing the crown of crowns. The first time, he's called the king of the Jews. 
The second time he comes, he's going to be called the king of kings. The first time he went to Jerusalem, he was mocked. The second time, they will tremble with fear. First time he rode in, he rode in as a man. But the second time, he's coming as God. When he went in the first time, he was meek and lowly. The second time he comes into Jerusalem, it's going to be with power and glory. The first time he ended up with nails driven into his hands. But when he comes the second time, he's going to be coming with a rod of iron. First time he, he was hung on the cross, but the second time he will be sitting on the throne of judgment. First time he was judged by Pilate, but this time he will be the one doing the judging. When he rode into Jerusalem, the first time he rode in as the lamb going to slaughter. The second time he's going to be returning as the lion of Judah. So when Jesus returns that day, that day in the future, he's going to be returning with power and glory. Are we ready for him? Are we ready for when he comes back? Jesus made that first trip into Jerusalem so that we can be redeemed. His road into Jerusalem actually began the day he was born in Bethlehem. He was born and lived a sinless life. And on this road, he taught with authority. He performed miracles, and he changed many lives. And then he made this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And there was many there that worshiped and praised him. But many of the same people that worshiped and praised him when he rode into Jerusalem turned on him just a few days later. He would face agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he prayed to his father in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was actually sweating blood. He would then be betrayed by Judas. He'd be denied by Peter. He would actually be abandoned by every one of his disciples. He was seized and arrested by his enemies. He was falsely tried, and he was falsely convicted. And then those same ones that greeted him when he came in the city and worshipped him, they're the ones that ended up crying, crucify him. And once they said crucify him, then he was scourged, he was beaten, he was stripped naked, he was mocked, and then he was crucified. And then his body had to be placed in a borrowed tomb. He didn't even have his own tomb. But, and this is a big but, three days later he rose. And he lives forever. He went through all of this for one reason. He went through all of this so that we can receive everlasting life. He made this right into Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, knowing he's going to die on the cross. We also knew by doing that, if we accepted what he did there, that we would have eternal life. That we could spend eternity with him. He did it all for us. So today, we have two responses that we can look at for what Jesus did on this road to victory. First, if we are lost, we can accept what he did and accept him as our Savior and, be, and become saved and have a, a future of eternal life. And if we're already saved, what we need to do is we need to continually praise his holy name. Stand with me this morning as we have our invitation.